Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, also a broadcast of the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And friends, this is airing on Israeli News Live because of the very unusual insights that the Lord has uh, placed on my heart regarding uh, some brand new revelations concerning the book of Micah. Something I really wanted to take the time to share with you. And I can't encourage you enough if you have friends that are Jewish, uh, whether they live in Israel, whether they live any part of the, the other part of the world there, and they do not know who the identity of the Messiah is. This is yet another prophecy that identifies the Messiah himself. And I want to just quickly, before I get started here, I want to share with you what happened to me today as I was studying, I was getting ready for a news broadcast, and I stumbled across, uh, upon this incredible revelation there. Uh, I was actually going down here to Micah chapter 7, going back to the, the famed biblical passage there that I've shared with you so, much, uh, so many times in verse 13 there. And the land shall be desolate for them that dwell therein because of the fruit of their doings. Now, <clears throat> we've looked at this in light of Syria, modern-day Syria, and how that Syria has really become a ruinous heap the entire country has uh, as a result of so-called civil war. But the civil war is really not because of the Syrian people, uh, although some of their own citizens have contributed to it, but it has been from outside interference inside of this nation. And, of course, we've mentioned this, we mentioned about what would happen in the last part of the days and how that the prophecy here in verses 12 and 13 applied to modern times. But when I began to head in this direction, and I was going to the Bible to look at it, I actually picked up my, my physical Bible and started to read this here, I started with verse 6, For the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men of his own house. And that's when the Lord began to reveal to me what that passage means. I got so caught up in the revelation that I had to go and look at the entire chapter again. And as I did, it began to come to life. Micah chapter 7. I want to share that with you now. Woe is me, for I am as the last of the summer fruits, as the great gleanings of, vin of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat, nor first ripe fig, which my soul desireth. Now, if you look in the King James Bible, they're going to type this as grapes through the entire uh, verse there. And quite frankly, neither the word grapes nor the word figs are mentioned in the verse. But it does speak about the clusters of fruit. But notice what is written here. Whether you look at this as grapes or figs, either one, it is clearly identifying yet once again in prophecy the Messiah himself and one particular sign about him that would acknowledge that he was indeed the Messiah. Now you may think, Steve, I think you're a little bit going overboard here. Notice what it says again. Woe is me, for I am as the last of the summer fruits. Also sets the stage. As the grape gleanings of the vintage, there is no cluster to eat, nor first ripe fig which my soul desireth. I think many of you probably are already beginning to realize where we're going when we talk about the Messiah. Because Yeshua... In the book of Matthew, also in the recorded in the book of Luke as well, when he was coming in, there was a fig tree that he saw afar off, but when he got near it, there were no figs upon it. What his soul desired was not there. According to Matthew and according to Luke, he cursed the tree. But I think it's interesting that Micah, Speaking of the Messiah, and not only in verse 1, you're going to find in other places as well. Let's continue on. The godly man is perished out of the earth, and the upright among men is no more. 
They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. Now it doesn't actually use the word man there, but it does say that that godly one is no longer there. He's perished. And of course, again, a clear evidence of the Mashiach. Doesn't Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9 said that that prince, that anointed prince that would come would be cut off, but not for himself? Yet again, we see the Messiah. The godly man is perished out of the earth. Or the godly is perished. Interesting, isn't it? Their hands are upon that which is evil to do it diligently. The prince asketh the judge is ready for a reward, and the great man he uttereth the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. And this is actually where it's going to climax uh, with the, the land becoming desolate because of their own doing. All of the evil that is going on in today's world in the Middle East. The best of them is a briar, verse 4. The most upright is worse than a thorn hedge. Again, speaking of the Messiah. The best of them is a briar. The most upright is worse than a thorn hedge. Worse than those Roman soldiers that plated the crown of thorns and put it on the head of the Messiah, Yeshua, 2,000 years ago. He's worse than they are. The day of thy watchman, even thy visitation is come. Now shall be their perplexity. The visitation... The coming of the Messiah. Trust you not in a friend. Put you not confidence in a familiar friend. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. Now that gets very interesting because when we begin to look at her that lieth in your bosom, that is the Roman covenant that Shimon Perez made in modern days breaking the covenant that was made between Jacob and Laban. Not only did Shimon Perez break the covenant between that of Jacob and Laban, but we also find that Ahab did the exact same thing. That covenant, as you may remember over in the book of Genesis there, when Laban overtakes Jacob when he's on his way back home after he served Jacob for 14 years for his two daughters. And by the way, the daughters are Syrian. They lived in the country of Aram, which is called Assyria in your translations in the uh, King James Version Bible. And some people try to say that Rachel and uh, Leah are from Lebanon. Are you serious? Are you really serious about that? Does anybody forget that when Jacob goes to his father-in-law, or excuse me, his uncle Laban, he goes from Hebron, he crosses through Jerusalem. Uh, this is where the famous vision of the ladder up into heaven appears. He goes from there down to the Jordan River. He crosses the Jordan River. He doesn't go to the northern border of Israel and cross into uh, Lebanon. He crosses the Jordan River. He goes across Mount Gilead, which was where Gad's tribe was living at at that time. Let me just give you a little visual so we can see exactly where he actually goes and where he traveled to because he's going to Haran. All right? Haran is where he was headed to. Now, <clears throat> we'll use Israel as our plumb line here. All right? To give you a little idea. <clears throat> he comes from Hebron down here in the uh, south of Jerusalem. He goes to Jerusalem. He camps there. He sees the vision of the ladder, the angels ascending and descending. He goes down and he crosses the Jordan River. He goes up what is now today known as northwestern, um, the northwestern part of Jordan, where Mount Gilead is, which is right here around uh, Urbid. He crosses through there, goes up through Damascus, doesn't do anything about Lebanon, never even crosses into Lebanon. 
Now we'll back out just a little bit. Now he's going to track all the way north here, coming across. He's going to cross the Euphrates River in right way up in this area, right in here, maybe even possibly into what we call modern day Turkey, which was all considered Syria back in those days there. He goes there to his father-in-law and that's where he serves him for 14 years. On his way back home, Laban overtakes him in Gilead, right here, just outside of modern day Syria where it's called Jordan. This is where the covenant is actually made between the two men. Not only to do neither one harm to the other, and they built the rocks of, uh, there in Gilead, but also Laban prophesied and said, If you take unto you any other daughters other than my daughters to be your wife, God be a judge. Even though he says, I am not present, God be a judge between me and you. Now, Jacob never broke that covenant with Laban. And Laban never broke the covenant with Jacob. But you know what's funny though, is we do find a war between Syria and Israel. At this point, it was the house of Israel. And oddly enough, it was all over Gilead. Right there. And the Syrians were warring against Israel. Even Judah, house of Judah, began to join in the battle. Uh, Jehoshaphat was going to join in with that with Ahab. Remember how he goes up and, and uh, Jehoshaphat says to Ahab, is there a prophet of the Lord? He says, I've got 400 of them. And they've all prophesied in one mind and one accord. Go up, the Lord is with you. Go to Gilead. Why? Because the Syrians had already came down there and taken that part of that land away. He said, God, give us this land. It's our land. They ain't got no business being there. Why did Syria cross the mount uh, that was made there by Laban? Because the prophecy had been broken by Ahab in the first place. Ahab dishonored his father when he married Jezebel and brought idolatry, a Balaamite, into Israel. All right, now let's back up, look at the scripture again. As we move on, trust you not in a friend, put you not confidence in a familiar friend. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. Now it's Rome, which, by the way, according to the scripture, is mystery Babylon. Now, verse 6, For the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter riseth up against her mother. All right, the son dishonors the father. Notice the verbiage in here, right? Both Shimon Perez even Netanyahu today has done the exact same thing that Ahab did. They have married a wife that does not belong to Israel. It is not one of either the daughters of Israel, not, and, and, and that includes the daughters of Syria. Laban's own daughters. He said, if you take any other wives other than my daughters, God be a judge between me and you. Ahab broke it first, it brought war. Eventually, God allowed the Syrians to conquer the house of Israel and they were dispersed to the entire earth as a result of their sins. Part of them did remain in modern day Syria in the part of Damascus. They ended up believing the message of Jesus Christ when he come on the earth and as a result, there has been a community of descendants of the house of Israel as Christian believers living in Syria to this very day. Hmm. The daughter riseth up against her mother. The daughter of Israel, the, de the descendants that are living there today, 
of the house of Judah, O daughter of Zion, you have rose up against your own mother. Your mother is a Syrian. Both Rachel and Aaliyah and their maids whom Jacob had children that made the 12 tribes of Israel from all four women. And where are they all from? They are Syrians. And the daughter is not dishonors their mother, raises up against her. You went to war against her. Now you wonder what's going on in Syria? Now the thing is, the daughter doesn't just include modern day Israel. It also includes that British and American empire where the house of Israel has been dispersed unto. Because Jacob and the mothers of Israel, that includes all 12 tribes. That NATO force along with also the modern day Israel you have raised up against your mother. You have brought a military force and you have caused calamity inside of Syria today. You can go get all your little itching ear teachers you want that claim to be Christians and I'm not saying that they're not and claim to be telling you they know what this whole thing is about Syria and let me tell you something though but when it doesn't match God's word it's a lie. Did, let me, did you ever see any of the prophets ever glorify Everything about Israel? Yeah, there were some that glorified them. They were Ahab's prophets, Jezebel's prophets. They all said, yes, go up. The Lord is with you. God has given you this land. You will defeat Syria and drive them plumb back into the sea or whatever. I'm just paraphrasing. But Micah comes up. Isn't it interesting? Micah, totally different. Oh yeah, go up. The Lord's with you. Ahab said, didn't I tell you he always prophesied, you know, he, he, no, Ahab said, he says to him, he said, he says, he said, I said, you say only to me what the Lord says for you to say. And Micah said, okay, I see Israel scattered as a, like sheep having no shepherd. He looked at Jehoshaphat, he said, I told you, he always prophesies evil against me. Do you think because Israel's back in her homeland today that everything's supposed to be peaches and cream? Have you forgotten that Micah says that when we would return, according to chapter 4, that because of the leaders of Israel, we'll be driven out of Jerusalem? Forget about that one, didn't you? Not the remnant of Israel, but those leaders are going to be driven out. And maybe the remnant have to go with them and dwell in the fields, according to the prophecy. God even asked the question, is there no king in thee? Is your counselor pair? Sure, you killed him 2,000 years ago. It's not always the way you think it, it is or should be. My Jewish brothers and sisters that are, that are living in Israel today, I'm asking you, please listen. I love you very dearly. But you're going to see too. Micah, he doesn't just stop there. Watch what else he says. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. What was Laban's prophecy? If you take any other daughter other than that of my daughters, God be a judge between you and me. And when Ahab and with Shimon Perez married the Vatican into Israel, the one that lieth in your bosom, remember? Remember what he says about her? When you brought her in, she became the daughter-in-law to the mothers of Israel. And the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So it's not only is it the fact that the daughters of, of Israel have risen up against their mothers, which is Syria, but also the daughter-in-law. Because the son dishonored his father, broke the covenant, 
that Laban and Jacob made together, and you brought in idolatry into Israel by bringing in Rome and the Babylonian Empire into Israel, now your daughter-in-law, Ahab's wife Jezebel, or the Roman Catholic Church of today that's been re-brought back into Israel, your new daughter-in-law is rising up against your own mother-in-law, her own mother-in-law, which is a twofold purpose. She's against Israel and she's against the Syrian Empire or the, Syrian, the, the country of Syria today. That's why the Pope of Rome sides with the Palestinians all the time and uses the Palestinians to rile up the, the Jewish people. And of course, the government goes in there and riles up the Palestinians. Next thing you know, we have innocent people being killed or imprisoned. There's a lot going on in Israel that you don't realize, friends. It's sad to say. But it's, the thing is that I'm trying to get even our Palestinian friends to understand is you're being riled up as well by this covenant of Rome. Because Rome in Daniel 11's prophecy as well said that she comes up strong with a small people. That's the Palestinians. Daniel also speaks about that there would be a covenant that, that, that the sons of the lawless would try to would rise up with Rome and try to marry the vision. Try to bring a falsified millennial reign. So now the mother-in-law, the daughter-in-law, the mother-in-law, Rome. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Yeah, because we married into it. But you know, the interesting thing is, is the stage has to be reset. Remember Yeshua was here? He read in Isaiah 61, verse 1, half a verse 2, leaves off the, uh, leaves off the other half. Maybe you, ought to, maybe you ought to read it real quick just so you know where we're at. I don't want nobody to be lost about this. All right? Yeshayahu, Isaiah. All right, right here. Chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to bring good tidings unto the humble. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the eyes to them that are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's good pleasure. And then he closed the book, handed it back to the priest, and he said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing. He didn't read the other half of verse 2. In the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them garland for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the mantle of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That's Zechariah chapter 12. They will look upon him whom they have thrust through. And they will weep as a family that lost their only son. That's modern day Israel. You know how you know it is? I'll take you over to that one as well. Let's just jump into it real quick. Might as well go ahead and do it while we're here. Right? Modern day Israel. You don't think it is? I'll show you it is. Zechariah chapter 12, right? What do we have here? The chiefs of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength through the Lord, a host of their God. In that day I will make the chiefs of Judah like a pan of a fire among the wood and like a torch a fire among sheaves, and they shall devour all the peoples round about on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of what? Judah first. The house of Judah. People say that the remnant of the house of Judah has not returned to the homeland that is some other race of people on the earth here. Then God's a liar and can't keep his word. Because friend, every biblical prophecy is fulfilling all around it and they have to be there, at least a remnant of them, or God can't keep his own word. And I don't believe God is like that. That the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem be not magnified above Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He, and he that stumbleth among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be, as a, be a godlike being as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they shall look unto me because they have thrust him through or 
therefore pierced him, as you have in King James, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for the firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as in the morning of Hadad Rimon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the house of David apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, their wives apart, and the family of Shemites apart, and their wives apart. Look, Shemite was a Benjamite. David and Nathan were of the house of Judah. Uh, the Levites, of course, being Levi, and all the families that remain are the Samaritans, half Jew, half Gentile. We got the same thing today, friends. Even the Palestinians have Jewish lineage in them. And you're out there trying to kill them all. Jeez. And the Palestinians trying to kill the Jews. And neither one of them got any brains in knowing who's who. But that shows you. See, they don't know what tribal order they belong in. That's why Zechariah brings them by family name and not by tribal name. All right? So, let's back up over here again then. Back over to Micah. But as for me, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. Though I am fallen, I shall arise. Though I sit in darkness, O Lord, is a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause. Even the remnant accepting responsibility for what Israel has done not just those in modern day Israel, friends. That includes those in the United States, Great Britain, everywhere that the children of the house of Israel have moved to. Ephraim's more specifically in prophecy. Until he plead my cause, execute judgment for me, he will bring me forth what? To the light. Oh my gosh, again, the Messiah. And I shall behold what? His righteousness. The Messiah. Thy, then mine enemy shall see it, and shame shall cover her. Who's that? The daughter-in-law, Rome. Who said unto me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eye shall gaze upon her now. She shall be trodden down as the mire of the streets. The day for building thy walls, even that day, shall be far removed. Remember the walls they were building in Israel to separate the Palestinians and the Jews? That day will be far removed. There shall be a day when they shall come unto you from Assyria, even to the cities of Egypt, and from Egypt even to the river, and from sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. Egypt is mentioned. You know, you know why I was talking about Egypt and Assyria? Because Rome wants to revive the Babylonian Empire and conquer the land from the Nile River in Egypt all the way to the Euphrates in Syria. Egypt was overthrown when they did the Arab Spring. And Washington helped them. Putting that thought in the man's brain to make him take and set himself on fire in Tunisia that set the whole Muslim Brotherhood of Fire. Obama leading the way for them. Then, of course, Assyria. That's including all the way from the land of Nineveh when ISIS was over there. ISIS ransacked everything, took all the gold. $429 million worth of bullion gold was taken out of the bank in Mosul, the very city, the ancient city of Nineveh. They even burnt down the gates of Nineveh. Did you know that? Did you know Nahum prophesied of that? I shared that with you before. Let me just go back, my Jewish brothers. I hope you're listening, rabbis. You need to be listening because I tell you one thing, all these things have been happening all around you and I don't even know if you even realize what's going on. Nahum, chapter 2. I don't know, maybe around verse 9 or so. Let's just look real quick here. But Nineveh hath he been from of old like a pool of water. In other words, Nineveh's never passed away. It's still there. 
Yet they flee away, stand, stand, but none looketh back. Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, for there is no end of the storehouse, store rich with all precious vessels. She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth and the knees smite together in convulsions as in the loins, and the faces of them have gathered blackness. Don't think modern day prophecy has not been fulfilled. You can even go after Nahum. You can go over there to Habakkuk as well. And you find out after they do all the looting and selling all of the... Because I think Habakkuk speaks about the fine furnishings that they take as well. And of course, ISIS was selling on eBay the fine antique furniture over in Mosul, part of the Assyrian Empire. Unreal. So he says here, they come to you from the cities of Egypt and from Egypt even the river and from sea to sea and from the mountain to mountain. They're trying to take over the entire empire, the whole Babylonian empire. I think the sea to sea is the black sea to the Mediterranean. Rome wants to conquer all of it. Not just Rome. Remember how they try to say, oh, the Zionists want to restart the Zionist empire. From the Nile to the Euphrates. Why? Because God told Abraham, I'm giving you this land from the, Nile, from the Nile River to the Euphrates. But the problem is what you don't realize, you don't need a war in order to fulfill the prophecy of Abraham. Abraham's children are living from the Nile River all the way to the Euphrates. So why did you need a war? So he goes on to say here in Micah, the land shall be desolate for them that dwell therein because the fruit of their doings. Whose? The son, the daughter, modern day Israel, and the daughter-in-law, Rome. Well, what does Rome do? Rome is using the NATO military. Yeah, they run it. Didn't know that? Sure they do. Tend thy people though. Watch what God does. Yeshua the Messiah is going to take and send his shepherd back. One of those two witnesses. Tend thy people with thy staff, the flock of thy heritage. Ro'e amcha b'shebetecha. Zion nechaletecha. See? Feed your people with your rod. The staff of your heritage. You know those running around, the guys that claim that they're Moses today, they're one of the two witnesses. You know how many I've seen? How many? I've, I mean, I've had many of them contact me. I think every one of them's got a staff in their hand. They tell me about their staffs. I'm not here to condemn them. You know, I love these men. They, they, they mean well. They just don't understand. But Moses isn't coming back with a stick in his hand, friends. He's coming back with that in his own DNA. His rod, his staff is within him. He says to him, God says to him, that they that dwell solitary as a forest in the midst of the fruitful field. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. In other words, remember the covenant that you made with your father-in-law. And quit forsaking the covenant. As in the days of thy coming forth out of uh, out of the land of Egypt will I show unto him wonders, not marvelous things, wonders, nifalot. Sounds like Moses fulfilling the prophecy over there in, uh, what is that, uh, Exodus 32 or 30, I think it's 32. Right after the Ten Commandments and God says to Moses, I will do wonders with you as I have never done. And the people that you are there, when you go there, will see it. God had already told Moses he wasn't going to the promised land. So how's Moses going to the promised land? What is it? God doesn't forgot what he told Moses he wasn't going? No, God knows Moses was coming back. So for those of you that think that Moses can't be one of the two witnesses, how does that work out? Well, maybe it's just a prophecy that never gets fulfilled, right? No, God's never slack concerning his word. The nations shall see and be put to shame for all their might. No matter how strong all the nuclear weapons they got, they'll be ashamed at the power that comes there this time. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth, their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like serpent, like crawling things out of the earth. They shall come trembling out of their closed places. They shall come with fear unto the Lord our God and shall be afraid because of you. You, Mimecha, 
ויראו ממך. They will see. They'll be afraid because what they see you doing. Who is God like unto thee that pardoneth the iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will again have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all the sins into the depths of the sea. Daniel chapter 9, when their iniquity shall have an end in the 70th week of Daniel. Thou wilt show faithfulness to Jacob, mercy to Abraham, as thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. I trust this is a blessing to you. It has blessed my heart unbelievably so. That the Lord has found His servant so beyond words that I could say that He would love me enough to reveal these things to me that I could share them with you. Share them with a Jewish friend. Pray for them that their eyes will become open. I know that there is a movement happening in Israel right now. But there will be a far greater movement in the very near future. And that day is nearly here. Stand with us in the ministry that we're doing here. We need your support. So that we can reach out like never before. I know it's not a pleasant message. There are those out there that will tickle your ears and tell you we should go and just burn Syria to the ground. But I've proven to you over and over again by the word of Almighty God, we are not to go burn Syria to the ground. Do you think if Yeshua was here, he would be warring against everybody on the left and on the right and just burning everybody up? Seriously, friends. Help us to get this message out to the world, friends. We're desperately looking for a transcriber as well. We have people in China longing to hear more of these words. You can even be transcribing right now. Just send it to me. StephenBenoon at gmail.com or IsraeliNewsLive at gmail.com. Either way. God bless you and thank you for watching. Erev Tov.